I was born in Vienna uh, and lived in Vienna in Paracelsusgasse, in the third district of Vienna. And in fact, virtually all my life in Vienna was in, the, in that particular flat. Vienna has got 29, uh, 21 districts. We lived in the ninth Bezirk. The Jewish district, in actual fact, was the second Bezirk in Vienna. We did not live there. I'll tell you the address. I'll tell it to you first of all in German. It sounds better that mm. way. Wien 10, Buchengasse 84, Erster Stock, Tier 15. Now, if you haven't tumbled what that was, it was the Buchengasse and um, on, uh, 84 on the first floor, door number 15, or apartment number 15. Uh, Ottergring, it was called, in 16. Bezirk. Parkring number vier, four, four parkring, which was on the Ringstraße, was a very fine district, beautiful district, lovely view over the Stadtpark. I remember there was a um, um, material shop underneath. I remember that, and our flat was above the material. We lived in a flat. It was only a small flat how we all lived, I don't know. The distances in Vienna were short. You could walk everywhere, and it was all very easy. Five, ten minutes at most. We used to go where we lived on the Danube Canal, up the Berggasse. And in the eighth district, Josefstadt, Hammelingplatz, number four, and it was apartment 22. It was in Pazetti Straße. This was a flat. Um, it was a typical Viennese block of flats, four or five stories. We lived on the the first floor, or the mezzanine as it was called, mm. or the piano nobile. And I think it was the largest flat in the house. Uh, I believe it was the only flat which had its own bathroom. Well, the apartment, um, nowadays p people wouldn't live in the conditions like that. We had um, the traditional Zimmerküche cabinet, which means one room, a kitchen and a box room. Now remember there were four of us. Uh, the toilet was outside, shared by about four families. There was always a waiting period outside. Uh, and the water was outside, a kitchen without any water. But, you know, we, we didn't know any better. We, we didn't know anything else, and that was life. My mother worked hard as a dressmaker and my father worked, and they spoke several languages. Because when you come from Czechoslovakia, you speak German, Hungarian, they could understand Polish and Romanian. So all the neighbors around, they could make themselves understood with all those different languages. Both my parents were born in Vienna, but um, like most Viennese, they had parents and grandparents who came from everywhere in the Habsburg monarchy, on my father's side from Moravia, on my mother's side from Hungary. Um, my grandfather was born uh, in Chernovitz, Romania. Uh, my mo um, my um, father was also born in Chernovitz, Romania, and then migrated with his father to Vienna. Now, my, my parents were both Austrian citizens, born in Austria, and my father was bo actually born in Przemysl, which is a small town in Poland, but that part was actually part of the Austrian Empire. Now, my mother is second generation uh, Viennese Jews, and um, my mother especially uh, considered herself um, Aust well Viennese first, then Austrian, and then way back uh, Jewish. My father's people were from Moravia, which was not uh, a big Yiddish area, not like in Poland or, or in Lithuania or whatever. Um, they were Jewish, most certainly, but they weren't um, probably not really Yiddish speakers. They were German speakers. Most, most Czech Jews were German speakers, as in Kafka, etc. <laughs> and um, my grandfather, of course, was Hungarian-speaking, still had that accent, too. 
Whereas my grandmother, his wife, um, uh, was from Niederösterreich. That's where my mother was born too. And they were long established uh, Austrian Jews. My parents uh, ran and owned two cinemas. Uh, the Admiral Lichtspiele in the Burggasse and the um, uh, Johann Strauss Lichtspiele, Johann Strauss Kino in the Favoritengasse, which is in Vienna 4. My father, by the way, was a publisher and his office, by the time I grew up, was actually in the same building uh, in which we lived. I like I like the publishing atmosphere, uh, which is obviously why I, I took to it. And I wrote uh, a little verse at the time, which was, the Vater von der Elli verlegt den Machiavelli. I must have been about four or five. My father was a very progressive man. He was a bookseller and publisher in Vienna. Uh, together with his brother. They were soon established as the f one of the first, if not the first, social democratic bookshop in Vienna. My father was a first generation graduate. Uh, he practiced as a civil engineer. He would had the very wide training that the Technical University in Vienna gave. So he was also qualified as an architect and was very interested in design of all kinds. In fact, the chair I'm sitting in was designed by him. When my father was still employed, before he lost his job in the Great Depression of 1931, we were sort of lower middle class. In fact, we were the envy of our neighbours. We lived in a council estate, but we actually had a bathroom installed, which was fairly unique. But uh, after 1931, uh, our economic position deteriorated. My father was a hard-working man, but unfortunately, like so many in Vienna, unemployed for the best part of the life that I had in Vienna. Uh, he was by trade a confectioner, but in those days people couldn't afford bread, let alone cakes, so he had to sort of do whatever he could. In the winter there was always uh, snow shoveling to be done, the local council would call upon any unemployed and there were quite a queue for that to shift the snow. Financially, we were very, very bad off. And I remember 1934, no, 1936, somebody offered us a chance to take over a milk shop, a kosher milk shop, where, but it means that my mother had to be there to serve. The milk shop, we were only selling milk and we had to deliver it. I, as a child, when I was 11 years of age, was in the, bin, was in the shop, six o'clock in the morning. My father, uh, his main business was eggs. And, and all the egg merchants would meet in the Zweiten Bezirk in a certain cafe. That's how it was. Each, each trade w used to meet in a cafe where they discussed business and they also played games like domino, very popular. Uh, they had a meal there. Everything happened in the cafe. It was a sort of a social life. They went to the coffee house, my father. <laughs> Every day after lunch, we had a coffee house on the corner and went for his mocha. And that's where we found him. <laughs> the coffee house would be your living room. And the Herr Ober, the head waiter, would make you feel as if you were the most important person he's ever, ever met. We used to sit with one coffee for the whole afternoon and evening. But no matter what beverage you were, Head, you would always have the Sahne, the Schlack Obers, as it's called Viennese. And believe you me, I've tasted cream in Devon and in Cornwall, <laughs> but the Schlack Obers still tops it. First, it was called the Marked Coffee. I'll show you a picture. Then later, he called it after our name Cafe Boxer. We even had a piano there, which was being played by a musician weekends. 
so we had weekend music. Otherwise, we had uh, the playroom where people played chess and cards. That's how I learned how to play chess. I was a fairly good chess player. We had one, one thing in Vienna that before the Germans marched in, which was, I thought, a marvellous thing. It was a subscription for students, for school children. Um, for, I, don't, I have no idea how much it cost, but you had an annual a subscription, and for that you were allowed so many theatres, so many concerts, so many opera productions. And I remember I, I remember saying to my parents when my birthday came along, I said, I, I don't want a party anymore. I, I want one of those subscriptions, <laughs> which I was promptly given, yeah. I started playing the violin when I was seven. My first teacher was a relative who is still alive, lives in New York. And then I had various teachers. At the age of 12, I was taken by my uh, mother's brother, my favorite uncle, the one who really uh, stood in, in loco parentis to me after my father's death. I was taken to the Burgtheater and I became theater obsessed from that moment onwards. So my, the two great passions of my early adolescence were po left-wing politics and the theater. You know, I used to go to concerts on a regular basis. I became an avid autograph collector. So I used to go around the back stage of the opera house or the theater and collect autograph. I had a very, very good collection of autographs, but I wasn't allowed to take it. I remember one day my mother taking us to a cinema. I remember seeing Shirley Temple. I remember that distinctly. And, uh, but I only remember going once. I remember once, just once, um, I was taken to a cinema. I remember seeing the Shirley Temple film. Our entertainment was at home, actually. We used to have a piano, we used to learn to play the piano, we sang and we, you know, it was all family, family entertainment. There was a piano in our apartment, there was a piano, in fact, in both my grandparents' houses, so whenever we visited, uh, we could go to the piano and have sing songs. I used to go dancing a lot, <laughs> yes. We had the Stadtpark, that is the park, the garden in Vienna, open air dancing and coffee and all that. Sunday, that was the usual thing. Or we went in the country to the woods and the mountains and climbing. I was the only Jewish girl in, in my form and um, I remember being a little bit embarrassed, um, having to take a, a letter into school every time we had a, one of those special holidays, that's uh, Jewish um, uh, celebrations that we were about the only ones that we observed. I went to the to a Jewish school, to the so-called Chayes Real Gymnasium, which was quite well known then. My father sent me to a boarding school called the Bundeserziehungsanstalt in Breitensee because he thought that a communal education would be better than a family life. I didn't like the school much because I, well, I didn't like school altogether. I was lazy, <laughs> I never did much work. But being confessionslos, I was the envy of my school colleagues because I could go into the garden while they had their religious lessons and I could read a book or just wander around. There was close, close contact in, in the school and certainly in the primary class, my friends were very equally distributed between, between Jews and non-Jews. Kurt and I had a wonderful relationship, you know, because we had the best of both worlds. 
uh, in our Chanukah, he would come to see our menorah, the candles lit, and I would go in and enjoy Father Christmas. For us lads, it was marvelous. But uh, in 1938, things were changing rapidly. The grown-ups were talking more excited. The conversation in the coffee house became more animated. Now I could make none of this and all of a sudden that hurt more than anything else. I was no longer chosen for the school football team. I remember I was 10. That hurt. Why, what have I done? I've, I've played as good as ever. And then I was to begin to hear the dreaded word, Jude. We as schoolboys, aged say eight, nine, ten, were acutely conscious of boys who were, were called Nazis because they, they tucked away their swastika uh, under, the, under the school books and then occasionally put them on their arm, like armbands, and uh, they called us uh, dirty Jew and things like that. And sometimes there were fights, and sometimes the non-Jewish boys t uh, def defended us, and we defended them. I had, I had a friend, a girl, she was a very special friend. We used to, and I knew she was a Nazi. I knew her parents were. And the last day before Hitler came on the, it must have been the, it must have been the 10th of March, or was it? No, the 10th, I think it probably was the 10th of March. We walked and in, then they were allowed to wear their little swastikas in the labels and I wore red, white and red. <laughs> and we walked together and she said, Will you understand, if, if it happens, that it probably will, that I, we won't be able to, to be friends like this, but I shall always love you. The Anschluss, I, I was very vivid because my school was in the Johannesgasse and the Ravak, the, the Austrian radio, was next door. And we came out of school, I think it was a, a Friday, on Thursday already, there were soldiers outside the radio station. And there was martial music played on the radio. And the radio crackled quite a lot, remember it was handmade. And every now and again the announcer would come to the microphone, stand by for an important announcement, stand by. And we children knew that things were taking place which we just couldn't understand. And then, again, I'm not quite sure, I think it was just after 11 o'clock, in the morning that is, the announcer came to the microphone to um, say that in a few moments, stand by, the Chancellor of the Republic, Dr. Kurt von Schuschnigg, would address the nation. And we listened to the Shushnik broadcast. I remember the Shushnik broadcast abdicating, actually. And I've never forgotten the breaking voice of Shushnik. There was a sort of, I mean, I really do remember that. It was a sort of, you know, the voice faded almost. It was a terrible thing. I wasn't sure what it was all about, but I realized that it was, an, I was, it was explained to me it was an abdication. And um, so, um, I, I realized what was happening. And I'm sure that Dr. Shushnik must have had tears in his eyes as he said that a few minutes earlier the President of the Republic, Dr. Miklas, I think his name was, has empowered the Chancellor to take charge of the security forces of the police, the gendarmerie, and in that capacity, he had given orders to the military at the border to allow German troops into our country unhindered. We kept indoors while hundreds of thousands were screaming, Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil. 
ein Volk, ein Reich, ein Führer, etc. Outside, especially in the center of the town. And um, that's interesting. Uh, when Hitler came, he was on the Heldenplatz, which was in front of the Imperial Palace, with God knows how many hundreds of thousands there. On the Sunday, there was Hitler came into Vienna, and we had a view from our window on the, uh, onto the parade, and the nurse put out her swastika flag out of our apartment windows, and we looked at the win uh, apartment windows, and there were sort of groups of schools going, and there was a group from my school, all my class were actually marching along with, with a sort of group. And um, it was really quite a strange sight. On my birthday, when the Germans came to Vienna, I actually saw all this cavalcade um, with cars and things, with Hitler standing in it, passing by our windows. And I saw Hitler in the car, passing our window, our street and he was sitting on top of the car, and everybody was jubilant. Hitler, Heil, Hitler, Heil, Hitler, everybody already changed overnight. And then there were planes overhead, and there were ramblings in the street. There were either lorries or tanks, I don't know, and I asked what was going on. And my parents did their best to explain that from then on, life would not be as it had been before, that one had to be extremely careful what one said to whom, uh, one had to avoid all indiscretions, and that from then on one was going to be a second-class citizen under suspicion, and that one might have all sorts of unpleasant experiences. And all that hidden anti-Semitism really came out, and um, it was brought home to me in the strangest way, actually, shortly after the Germans marched in the march. I, I, I don't know what the occasion was, I can't remember, but um, I had occasion to have a little party, I don't suppose it was a party, just a, I invited a few of my school friends um, for tea, and um, to my utter astonishment, and, and I have to say horror, nobody turned up. We were thrown out of school, I think it was about a month and a half later, and went to, these, to some other schools, organized by the Kultuskommande, where you learned English or French or Hebrew. As I said before, all the Jewish children were delegated to schools that they had to go to. And I went to this one in the Kastelitz Gasse, I was delegated there. I think we still lived in the Winter Gasse, it wasn't all that far away, but then we moved in, had to move into the Kastelitz Gasse. Very soon um, I had to leave my school and go to a Jewish school where strangely enough the education was actually superb because we had, we had uh, Jewish teachers and for some reason certainly the standard was very high. But uh, I mean we were earmarked, we were pariahs, we were, we were Jews. There was always this element of the unpredictable in Vienna. Um, I mean anti-Semitism was much more violent than in Germany, it was much more widespread. Uh, the looting, uh, the so-called wild expropriations uh, happened much more quickly and much more thoroughly. But at the same time, you got remnants of Viennese sentimentality and being a good chap. Uh, and you never knew where you were. Where you go to meet an op a thug, an opportunist, or someone who retained some of the old values. A van drew up in front of the shop and a mob of people uh, headed towards our shop. And one woman, her eyes I will never forget in my life, horrible, hateful eyes, stretching out her hand. This is also a Jewish shop. and. My father, my brother, and I we were standing inside, the feeling you can imagine. Um, then a man behind her took her on her shoulder, turned her around, and said, no, not this one. 
Can you imagine the relief it was and it went away? It was not uncommon that you went to the street and three or four boys came and started kicking and spitting at you and kicking you and hitting you. There's nothing you can do. We weren't allowed to go into any parks, cinemas, swimming pools. Um, life really changed very much overnight and uh, also um, as life became more and more difficult, uh, a lot of Jews committed suicide. And uh, there was one incident in my own family, which was, which was a, very, a tremendous Im impact on me and my whole family. My father's brother, my uncle, committed suicide when um, the Gestapo came for him. We had a maid, and she stayed with us until the, the day that, that we actually left. And uh, it was a very beautiful spring day and she was just coming, going down the stairs when two SS men came up and said to her, like, are the, the people, the, the, the folk in? So she looked and she knew that the house was full of, it was all Jewish people, was, and nobody would go out. Everybody was at home. And she says, ha, huh, she says, what do you think on a day like this that be at home? She said, uh, are you sure? She says, would they like an Aryan tell you a lie? Anyway, she started flirting with them and they went away. On Saturday, there was no school, although usually one went to school on Saturday morning. And uh, we were then told that there would be a school holiday for the rest of the week because of the Hitler and we wouldn't have to go to school for the next week. So um, in my father's mother was the one, in fact, and my father's sister, who had a small child, uh, were the ones who took my brother and me out. On the 15th in the evening, we went to the Südbahnhof, the southern railway station, with my paternal grandmother, my paternal aunt Bertha, her little boy aged one, Ellie aged nine, me aged eleven, got on a train to Merano, where we arrived in the early hours of the morning of the 16th of March. It was a weird trip. Uh, the frontier guards were not yet organized two days after the Anschluss to take people off trains and so on. Besides, we looked like skiing tourists. We, had, we were told by my, gr the grown-up family left in Vienna, and I think my father, take only rucksacks. Shortly after the Anschluss, my father was asked to play Nazi propaganda films, and he refused, and he was then arrested, and in common with a lot of others. Um, the Anschluss was on March the 13th, and um, he was uh, arrested towards the end of March and sent to Dachau initially. And then uh, after spending some time in Dachau, he was sent to Buchenwald. Well, the atmosphere was, of course, very depressed. Uh, when Jews got together, they would uh, mainly talk about emigrating or the uh, various efforts there, and also retraining. That, that was, another, that was another big issue at the time. The second most important one, apart from immigration, was retraining how people who had been in uh, professions that had no uh, real prospect in, in foreign countries because they depended on language, how, how one could uh, pick up a, tr a, a sort of a trade, a, uh, some, something manual with which one could earn one's living elsewhere. For nine months, my father and I trotted around Vienna, going from one consulate to another one. He wrote, um, and my mother was, was able, well, she, she, was, uh, she knew she would be going to England as a cook. And, uh, you know, and what they were trying to do was to get me coming, uh, going to, uh, and be a helper 
you know, I, without getting paid. Well, anything to get out, you see. But unfortunately, I was too young. I wasn't allowed to do that. I met another friend of mine. It was just a sheer, that's why I think it's a miracle that I'm still, it was just by coincidence. I met him in the road because they tried to emigrate anywhere. But nobody would let the Jews in. So I met somebody called Weinberger. I played football with him, what not. He says, Fritz, do you know? He used to call me Fritzl. You can get for a hundred dollars, you can go to the interest and buy a ticket and go to Shanghai. Don't need visa, nothing. There was a whole year under Hitler in Vienna, which was hard because every time there was a knock on the door, looking back, I think when you're young, you take chances because. I was really in great danger to be picked up any minute. And I still didn't want to leave until I got something done, which I think I achieved something to get quite a few people out. We all started learning foreign languages, frantically. We all took Spanish lessons in case we, were, we, we might emigrate to Latin America. Uh, I took Hebrew lessons in case we were going to go to Palestine. And I think my father picked up a bit of English. Um, so we tried as far as possible to prepare ourselves for the um, for immigration wherever. And in the end, um, it was the UK that turned up Trump's. Uh, what does stick in my mind is Kristallnacht. And that was very unpleasant, very unpleasant indeed. In Kristallnacht, in Vienna alone, they destroyed 23 major shoes and about 60 Stiebler prayer halls. I remember that day very clearly because, to my utter amazement, my mother came to fetch me from school, uh, which she'd never done before. And there were quite a few parents waiting for their children outside this Jewish school. So I think they must have got wind that something was afoot. And um, anyway, by the time we got, uh, my, my mother and I got home, um, they gave us two hours to get out of our flat. The day of the Kristallnacht, uh, we were collected from school during the middle of the day. And after that, we never went out again and I uh, saw some scenes on the way home which I don't want to see again. I actually saw them bring out uh, scrolls, Sifre Torah, and actually dance on them, and in one case urinate on them. That was certainly concentrated in my mind. Something like ten or a dozen stormtroopers just invaded a uh, flat, uh, looted everything they could lay their hands on, even to the extent of grabbing a necklace that had been that was around my sister's neck. And of course carted off my father and grandfather uh, to the Gestapo headquarters in the Schwedenplatz. But fortunately they emerged unscathed. My mother in the morning it was the tenth of November said to me, Otto, I want you to walk away as far as possible. It was cold. She put my, I put my heavy coat on. She saw the 10 shilling note, shilling that was our currency, for emergency. And she said to me, go as far away as you can and then come back when it's dark. Now, I felt this is rather strange because my mother had always told me not to go far away. But as I said earlier, I knew Vienna very well. I knew my way to the centre. And what I saw then, well, that was something which nobody, especially a child, should witness. I walked to the geographical heart of Vienna, which is St. Stephen's Cathedral, the Stephansturm. 
And I saw elderly men and women, obviously Jewish men and women, men with their beards, scrubbing the floor. You know, we have in Vienna still to this very day, and we certainly had um, horse-drawn taxi, we call them fiacre, you know, the French fiacre. And of course the, horse, the horses would cause a certain mess. And it was this mess that these people had to clear up. And there was police there. But the police was not to prevent this going on. The police was there to keep order because you were perfectly entitled to kick these people into the mess. But you had to take a turn. Now you've had your bit of fun, you come back. I think I grew up that day. Eventually we had a knock on our door, which we expected. And we didn't have a community. I don't think we had a phone. Maybe we had a phone to communicate with my aunt and uncle. I don't know. And um, the Nazis were there. And who was leading them? Our very nice, friendly neighbour. With them. And I came in and looked at them and said, well, we'll have the radio. We'll take the radio. I was able to go in the, out of the, in the back room and take the radio. I don't know if they took anything else, quite honestly. They might have taken one or two things. And I said, I, oh, to the most important thing, they took my father. Well, my father was taken to Dachau and this brother as well. And they were there three months in no, on November the 10th, 1938. And when, he, when my father came home, we hardly recognised him. He'd shrunk to a little boy. All we recognised was his voice. And my mother got him out from postcards that were written from the 1918 war. And that's how she managed to get him out of Dachau. I was arrested on the tent together with my father to go to Dachau concentration camp. We were lined up in a, in a yard, all Jews and communists, and oh, there was shouting going on. And I already had my paper that I was emigrating to Shanghai. They showed them the paper. I said, one minute. And after about five minutes, somebody shouted out, Boxer! I said, out. So I came out, and there was somebody sitting there. I said, there are my papers. I'm going to Shanghai next week. That was on the tent. So blah, blah, blah. They talked, talked, they looked at the paper. And out. You can go. I said, no, no, I can't go. My father is still there. What's the name? Heinrich Boxer. So I called out Heinrich Boxer. They came out and they said, you're also going to Schengen? And I kicked my father. I still remember that. Underneath. Said, yeah. Said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, he, he, he realized what the two men. Says, then they, apparently the fellow who was sitting there, they knew our coffee house as well. He says, I know your coffee house, you know. Yeah, we haven't, it's not no longer our coffee house, it's been taken away. My father was released in May 1939 uh, under some kind of amnesty which was then granted uh, to a lot of people. It was a political amnesty uh, to a lot of uh, people who had been um, arrested and he came back to Vienna and the formalities then took a few months for him to come out. My mother had produced, had, had, my mother had procured a forged uh, visa to a Central American Republic and with that, provided she could show she was willing to leave the country, she was let out. And uh, uh, she came to England on a domestic permit, domestic workers permit with my father and with myself. They were trying to get me to England somehow and I remember I had an interview with an English professor who came, who was sort of looking round for kids, you know. And somehow, I don't think he could have taken a liking to me because he said to my father, well, the boy can come to England. There's a, there's a boarding school in Whitby. I remember that very clearly, in Whitby, which I'd never heard of, of course, in Yorkshire. And, um, and of course, it would have been a, a, an expensive boarding school. And we couldn't do that anyway. And um, so it didn't happen. But then they got me onto the Kinder Transport, of, whom, of which there were many, one after the other, from about December to quite late. I came on my own. There were lots of children's transport 
because England let in about 10,000 Jewish children, the well-known kinder transports, but they, they had adults in charge of them, but I was entirely on my own. We had, we could go into kinder transport. I don't remember how much time we had, probably uh, 10 days or a fortnight at the outside. My parents then made quite sure that we had what they regarded as reasonable good clothing. We bought some things. My mother stitched into the into uh, all the clothing the name for uh, for us. We were taken around to some of our relatives whom we had hardly seen and so on to say goodbye and and uh, uh, it was a, suddenly everything went very, very rapidly, almost so rapidly that we uh, didn't appreciate what a huge, huge event this really was going to be. One day, my mother came to, to me with great affection, more so than usual. Otto will soon be going to England. I knew that each day for many, many weeks, she'd be queuing up by the Kultusgemeinde. Mm -hmm. That's the communal, the Jewish communal authority. And she must have succeeded to get me onto the Kindle transport list. And of course I took it for granted we were all going to England. And she said to me, no, you'll be going first and we'll join you soon. Soon, soon we'll join you. Well, they took a telephone book and they went down with a pin and this one and that one and eventually they found somebody in Buckinghamshire here uh, to say they needed some man or something. They, they would give him a visa and he got this visa and my mother and I would came on a domestic permit. She was going to be a domestic. She didn't know from one spoon to another but she was a businesswoman. But it's the only way we could get out. Well, grandfather... Freud was uh, invited to come to Britain. Um, so we had a very easy time compared with almost everybody else uh, of um, emigrating. I left on the 17th November. Westbahnhof, that was that's the railway station, and from there on to Berlin. From Berlin, I have to get off and have to change. On the following day, to a train. You stay at the, in the railway station and to go on to the train to go to through Poland, and from Poland to get on to the Russian. I kissed the floor when I crossed the border. Believe you me, I did. I remember. The journey of the kinder transport was a, a very traumatic affair. First of all, uh, the Nazis had not allowed the departure to take place from the main railway station. They said uh, just uh, seeing so many Jews gathered together would incite the fury of the ordinary Viennese. So the whole thing took place from a suburban station and uh, also fairly late at night, I think, the train left at about 10 or 11 at night, and that's when I said goodbye to my mother with, with a great sense of foreboding. I remember leaving the flat and walking down to the station, and we were told to be very quiet, although the authorities knew we were going, but they didn't want to cause any problems must have closed their eyes to a lot of things. And uh, I remember the quiet, how quiet was from the station. And uh, none of us were crying. I can't remember. We weren't. I think we were just, we didn't know what was happening. We were only allowed, I think, one uh, coffer uh, suitcase. And uh, we went to the station, my mother, my father, lots of uh, other parents and children were there. There was uh, also, as far as I remember, uniformed German um, 
that is uh, there. So my mother stayed with some friends nearby uh, whilst my father went to see me off. He tried to, I started to cry. I was already in the train at the window and I started to cry and he said, in German, well, that Kopfhoff. And that's the last thing he said to me. My mother was trying very hard to be very brave, but they were both pretty affected by it. Um, it was the strangest thing because, you know, one grows up so quickly somehow. And I was, um, I, I was excited and apprehensive all at the same time. But just before the train was leaving, I remember the strangest thing I did. I, I, I was leaning out of the window saying goodbye, and I tore a, a little a sheet of paper out of my little notebook I had in my handbag, and I scribbled on it. And would you believe, at my age, I put on it, uh, never leave each other, always stay together. We got onto the train, and my sister, who had this impediment in walking because of her limp, she was the last person I was to see. My mother couldn't run. My sister could hardly run with her impediment, but she ran after the train, the whole platform of the train. Sei schön brav, which means be a good boy. Next Woche, next week, next week. I had a ticket from Vienna via Ostend to Dover, and then from Dover to London, where my sister was going to meet me. And I had very little money with me because we weren't allowed to take any money. Anyway, uh, there we were in the train and going through Belgium, towards the Belgium frontier, and the town called Aachen, that uh, was the frontier town, the train stopped and all the Jews had to get out. Judenraus. And so we all got out and everyone's luggage was minutely examined, as you can imagine. And then, for a reason that I can't fathom out to this day, everyone else was allowed back on the train except me. I was in a compartment with nuns, and I was the only, the only other person. All the others were nuns. And on the border coming to England, um, we stopped. The train stopped and on the loudspeaker uh, was announced all Jewish people collect their luggage and come out for a certain inspection. So I was going to get my case down, I only had two, one case, two case, get my case down and one of the nuns put her arm around me and said, you're not going out, you're staying with us. And I said, but I'm Jewish. So she said, you're staying with us, you don't go out. We got to the border between Germany and Holland and the train stopped and all the border Police, Nazi border police came aboard and inspected everybody and looked at everybody's thing. And they came to us and looked at my father's papers and looked at them and said, pointing at me, was sitting in the corner, shrunk up. Who's he? Father said, that's my son. So he says, but it says on here, without Jack, without Jack, it says on here, you can't take him. I was getting smaller and smaller in the corner. I can remember this conversation. So my father said, well, I can't leave him behind. He's only a little boy. I said, I'm sorry, I can't take him. What if they don't let him in in England and they've got to come back again? And it says on here, you cannot take him. And he's looking and looking at my father's papers. And all of a sudden, he said, I see you were an officer in the First World War. So my father says, that's correct. And the fella clicked his heels saluted as I am also an officer in the army. I salute you and I wish you the best of luck. I was taken into a little wooden hut and I can see it still. And uh, a great big woman, well she seemed a huge woman to me, um, stripped and searched me. I mean she was perfectly polite, she didn't, in fact she didn't say a word, she just did her duty, but 
it was a dreadful experience for a child. I mean, it, it really was. Well, um, she didn't find anything, obviously. Um, I was a bit shaken by the time I got back into the little office where they were examining my suitcase. Well, I only had a little suitcase with me because all my clothes were still in, in the flat. But for the first time, I was actually really scared because I saw them reading my diary. And in the diary, I had written in, uh, in the graphic language of a, of a teenager, you know, the, the march into Austria. The, uh, the, uh, and, and what particularly frightened me, because I realized they were reading my entry, uh, entry about my uncle's suicide. And that was the first time I actually got a bit scared. We arrived now at the border with Holland. I believe the town is called Venlo. It's peculiar because some uh, part of Venlo is in Holland and part is still in Germany. Now, as we were the last in the last carriage, still the German officials came in, and that passports, which I'll show you presently, how many times was that examined? How many times was it taken from us? Yes, there were actually some of the boys and two of the girls were taken off the train. The papers weren't in orders. You, know, you might well know what happened. And um, the train shunted over the border very, very slowly. There's a lot of rattling as the coaches bumped against each other. The two front coaches were already in Holland. We knew we could hear the children sing sang the Hatikva, a song of hope. But we were still on German soil. And it was after a lot, a lot of more examination that finally the train moved over that wonderful line into Holland. And when we pulled into the first station on the, on the Dutch uh, side of the frontier, we got a marvellous welcome with uh, uh, hot cocoa and I remember peeled boiled eggs and sandwiches and so on being given to us by, by a sort of committee of Dutch uh, volunteers. So from then on we, st we, we, we had been, by, by the people who accompanied the, the journey, the, the, sort of the adults uh, volunteered who, who, who travelled backwards and forwards with these kinder transports, we had been taught uh, a Dutch chant, which we then chanted in unison about long live Queen Wilhelmina. I saw the sea for the very first time. I couldn't believe it, so much water. I lived in Austria, I saw lakes and I saw the river Danube. See. I got on the boat and that was uh, an experience because I'd never been on a big boat before and I, I do remember being very seasick. And I remember my brother, one of my, my Hooger, my brother Hooger, taking me around the boat, showing me all like the big brother, you know, how old was he, 11, 12? Uh, yeah, 12 or 13 he was, 13 already. Anyway, and we arrived very early in the morning and uh, we met uh, my uncles at Harwich. That was very emotional. And here I was in England. I heard a language which, good uh, God, how can people speak a language like that? <laughs> and um, it was strange, so strange. Even. People were dressed different. I, we had the first. <laughs> what a wonderful welcome. The cup of tea. We drink different tea to what you drank here in England. We have lemon tea. Drunk of tea. And some sort of a bun, I don't know. Chelsea bun, but I don't know. And then came the journey across East Anglia, the plain of East Anglia to Liverpool Street. 
it was misty, it was foggy, it was at night. Uh, the steam trains were puffing away. Uh, because Liverpool Street was a much larger station than the Westbahnhof. You don't know where these great cast iron girders. Uh, the station was is divided in, t in two, or was in those days, and there was a taxi rank in the middle, which I thought was very odd. And then, well, what, what was the difference between London and, and Vienna? It was much bigger. Uh, it was obviously a much more prosperous place. Uh, it had double-decker buses. It had red telephone boxes. It had pillar boxes. It had York stone slabs on the pavements. It consisted of houses rather than flats. It had a much more extensive underground system. And they spoke a language I didn't understand. I think the, if, what the impression was of London, I think, in, if I remember rightly, was that one was overwhelmed by the scale of everything and the bustle and so on. It was a complete different world. I mean, this is until I got to school and so on, you know, which was rather different. We went on the underground, and of course I'd never seen, I'd never been on the underground before. It was all a bit overwhelming, but I do remember the, um, the staff uh, in the, on the underground in those days were wearing black uniforms. I don't know what color it is now. I think it's blue. But anyway, it was black in those days, and. I remember being tired and um, I was a bit alarmed because black uniforms meant Gestapo. When you get in that country, like, like I have done, you don't look around. Will I like it? Do, do I like it? No. I have to be here. That's it. I, I took things as they come. I never, I wasn't one of uh, fancy things, you know, thing. Oh, I can't. I don't want that. Uh, I can't do. I can't do with that. No. It's there. I have to be satisfied. As I said, I couldn't speak a word of English, and uh, I came to the yeshiva, which was very nice. People were very nice, very helpful. That was just about before Rosh Hashanah. And on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, I was taken to Sheriff Hill Hospital because I had scarlet fever. Right. I had nobody, absolutely nobody. I was there about for three or four weeks. And I had not much so, nothing whatsoever. I couldn't speak English. And there I was, and I was all day long finding Bloomsbury House because I couldn't speak. And I had those hand luggage with me. And I Eventually, uh, not a car, a uh, horse and car stopped, one of those in London. And he said, <laughs> must have had pity on me, where are you going? I couldn't, it was Euston Square I wanted, and I kept on saying Euston Square. I went down to the underground and asked a ticket for Euston. EU, I knew it was Euston. And the man said, there's no such thing as a station called Oyston. And I couldn't speak properly. And I said, Oyston, Oyston. And I was nearly at tears because that man wouldn't sell me a ticket. And I didn't know what to do. And then some, there was a queue building up behind me. And then somebody said, I think the man you means Houston. In the station itself, we were standing around. We had labels around our necks. And uh, then a uh, young lady came, and then she took us and in, uh, took us to the Peskins who were waiting there. And they introduced us to them. And uh, we were introduced to Dorothy and David Peskin. We, of course, uh, made a, a bowed and uh, and put a, clicked our heels which was not at all what was uh, in, ex either expected or wanted the jewish refugee Com committee took over and 
the next thing I found myself in a, um, my sister took me to this family in the east end of London and thinking back on it now I, I'm sure in fact I'm absolutely convinced the committee must have paid them because they were very poor people they were very kind but they were very poor themselves I think we were lucky to be taken in by this family for can I know I know we were um, we were certainly treated as if we were normal members of the family. We were made to feel at home. And above all, we were made to feel a natural part of the family. On the other hand, uh, uh, I received some very wise words um, from him. I called him uncle, because that's what he suggested I should do. The guardian. And he said, look, he said, you must not change your name. And you shouldn't even change the spelling of your name, if I were you. Because one day, you never know when, where, somebody may discover you in a telephone book. And this way, you might possibly find relatives that otherwise you wouldn't find at all. Barham House, Claydon, near Ipswich, Suffolk, and I always put on for good measure, England. That was out of pride. My first English address. Now, that I now know was in fact a workhouse. But they were so desperate to get the kids over that even if the arrangements weren't uh, completely made, get them over we were somehow because they knew that the war was just around the corner. Don't forget this is July, August, early September, the war started. So, um, Somehow they got many places. Dover Court was another place, a place in Broadstairs. But the place for Freddie and I was Barham House. And then, of course, there was the the business at uh, in the in the reception camp at, at near Lowestoft. These wooden chalets were a bit ramshackle. They were all right for the summer, but not for 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 the winter, for a rather severe winter. Sometimes we had a situation where the water in the hot water bottles that we needed actually froze. When we went to a school, they sent us to Church of England school in uh, Knights, Knightsbridge, that's right. Uh, and they put us together with the, in the nursery. That's the best way to learn a language among little ones, babies. Because a child, a little one, when he says a word, he points. So for about two weeks, we're in the nursery together with the little ones. And we learnt a few words then. Every time we used to get back home, we used to tell Mummy we learnt this word and we learnt that word, and that's how she learnt. We were sent to... My brother, in fact, had come over a few weeks earlier with my father to a school called Regent's Park School which was in Mersfield Gardens, was run on, as an English prep school, had been started by a headmistress, Jewish headmistress from Leipzig called Schindler, who had come over, I think, in 1933, started this school, especially for refugee children. And um, it, it ran, uh, had English teachers, but it had a, a sort of whole bevy of refugee domestic staff, including the matron who hardly spoke a word of English. Queensgate it was. And we stayed there for quite some time. Uh, and somehow I managed to practice there, yes. And I even remember how much it cost per person, per day and night, with full board, five shillings. We registered in Bloomsbury House in London, <coughs> and then went up to Leeds, where I had to go into a hostel, a hostel in Leeds, even though my grandmother did live there, but I don't, for some reason, I had to go in a hostel. And my parents went to work, <coughs> work as domestic servants. And this very nice family in a huge house, at a place called All near York. Uh, my mother was a cook, my father was um, 
the general <laughs> handyman, <laughs> and uh, and that's where they were. I was supposed to be an all-purpose domestic servant. I was supposed to uh, polish the floors in the house, sweep up, dust, uh, light the fires, or particularly the, the main boiler that provided hot water for the whole house. Then I was supposed to do gardening, and then the uh, sort of the the bait with which the job was advertised was that uh, whoever got the job would be trained as a chauffeur. But of course, I was only 15 at the time, so the thing was was totally illusory. I must have been a very difficult boy. I had seen a lot, you see, in, in Vienna. My brother was younger and was probably a little more pliable than I at that time. Uh, they finally decided, okay, let him learn agriculture the hard way. They didn't tell me that, but they took me to a farm. I don't know where they got the name from, in Nottingham. Nothing Jewish, whatever, at all. A farmer called Buxton, who, uh, and I was left there. I was left there as a boy, and I was a farmer's boy. Once he re the farmer realized that I was on my own, I was really treated very, very poorly. He had a wife and children. They, they, they really exploited me in, uh, as, as much as they could. I was working in a hotel, in Langham Hotel, on Mali Drive. And a very nice couple, a big hotel, about 60 bedrooms. And she was very nice, and she spoke also several languages, spoke perfect, the owner, perfect German, and so on. And she felt very, very sorry for me and very sad about the circumstances. And she always told me, in England, you have to put a smile on your face. You can't go around crying all the time because, you know, how we felt that we were very low. All those months before the war started, uh, all of us only thought of, of how to get our parents out. My father was over 60 by then and not, not terribly well. And he couldn't, she couldn't find a job for him. She had to find a, a guarantor. And the guarantor um, meant that somebody had to put a lot of money. I'm not quite sure. I, I always thought it was a thousand pounds, but anyway, what in those days was an astronomical sum for a complete stranger to put that money in the bank as a guarantee that this refugee wouldn't be a burden on the state. And how she did that, I, I, I shall never know. She found, I mean, considering she didn't know anybody, neither of us knew anybody here, she found someone who was prepared to do that. While Holland was still new, um, not invaded, we had what they call Red Cross letters, 25 words. And they still talked about, be a good boy next week. 25 words. When the war started, one of my close friends in, in, in the orphanage, his parents had gone out to Holland. And I used to write to my parents oh, via them. On the 31st of August, I got a telegram, Eltern, Eltern eintreffen Mittwoch, which means parents arriving on Wednesday. They somehow scraped enough money together to come here by air. They were due to arrive at, uh, at Croydon Air Airport on the 6th of September. And on the 3rd of September, the war broke out. They never made it. We all had, at first, at the outbreak of war, go to the police station and register. And I took a job for Burroughs Welcome, the medical company, as a photographer. Did some of their advertising photography and whatever else they needed. Their laboratories I photographed and so on. And that was a protected occupation, so I wasn't called up to the panic. When I was 16, the tribunal was in Reading, and my name was called out. 
<coughs> and I, I said the uh, name, uh, name uh, and age and so on. And I'm at school at the City of Oxford High School for boys. And um, I think they put a stamp and they gave me a kind of certificate. And I was classed as an enemy alien, brackets friendly, class two. May, June 1940. I was sitting my final examination for the first year, and I was just doing my math exams, and I'm good in math, and in walked the policeman into the examination room and arrested me and took me to the Loughborough jail. And a few days later, I was went to Liverpool and was loaded on the Dunera, and we had a nine weeks journey to Australia. We were put aboard a ship at Liverpool that took us across to the Isle of Man. When we disembarked at Douglas, uh, a crowd of curious onlookers assembled at the quayside, and I remember somebody saying to me, they are cheering us. I said, well, why, why are you saying that? He said, well, I can hear them saying, alien. Now, you've got to understand that in Hungarian, the word alien means long live. But of course, they were saying aliens, uh, enemy aliens had arrived. We wanted to join Daddy, didn't we? Who was there already? Who was in a man's camp in Ramsey in Isle of Man. But when the family came, there was a, a family camp, a hotel that half of it was kosher, half of it, you know, from and half of it wasn't. It was called the Bella Queenie Hotel in St. Mary's in the Isle of Man, and we, we joined there. There were facilities for school in the hotel. They made a, you know, a school for the children. Once we were in the Isle of Man, things were really good. I mean, we had a professor, not in our house, for example, he, he was a scientist. Eventually, he was released from camp and worked for the, for the government somewhere. The, the commander was very, very nice. There was, there was no, no complaints whatsoever. In actual fact, I think people were taken out to pictures once, uh, once in four weeks or something. And uh, we had, for example, I learned here tailoring to make ladies' coats and costumes. Well, internment was, of course, in the first instance, uh, an upheaval. But after a while, I settled down and uh, found it almost enjoyable because the sun was shining. This was the summer months of 1940. We were at the seaside. It was the Isle of Man. And we were taken under military escort to go, for, to, go to the beach and have a swim. I remember attending uh, two meetings there. One was a memorial meeting. Trotsky had just been assassinated, and there was a meeting about him, and then Jabotinsky had died, and there was another meeting organized by totally different people uh, to pay tribute to him. So this was some of the uh, social or cultural life that, that was being o organized at, in the internment camp. And I met one of my, my one of my Quartet colleagues, who became quartet colleagues later, of course. I met them before I went in. I went to the Isle of Man in another camp. The Peter, Peter Shidloff. Having only just turned sixteen, I was among the first to be released, and I came out in September, and it my arrival coincided with the beginning of the heavy bombing of London, so when I arrived at Euston Station, I couldn't even go home to Hackney. I had to sleep uh, on, on, on the underground platform. Everybody wanted to get out, nobody wanted to stay there. And you had to find a job before they would release you. They call it release. That was 1942. And my father got a job with a bakery here in Manchester.
there was a, um, an organization called Young Austria. To all of us, it was, let's face it, it was just an excuse to be somewhere, to have, uh, uh, have com the company of like-minded people, people with the same background, the same uh, difficulties. And um, we formed uh, a choir, I remember, and we even sang in the Wigmore Hall, if you please, the Young Austria Choir, yes, and um, we, we sang Haydn's uh, The Creation in Wigmore Hall. We sang all sorts of things. We sang Austrian stuff, classical stuff, and of course political stuff as well. The Arbeiter von Wien, you guys come across that? Wir sind das Bauvolk der kommenden Welt. <laughs> Wir sind das Bauvolk der kommenden Welt. Wir sind der Seemann, die Saat und das Feld, you know, and so on. <laughs> I remember him. he wrote them down at one time. It got us together twice, a, a, well, once a week, and uh, they also, the refugees also formed a, a theatre, uh, which was in, in Eaton Avenue in Swiss Cottage in the Austrian centre. And it was a, an excuse of a stage. And actually well-known actors who had escaped from Germany um, produced some very, very good plays there on a makeshift stage. And uh, that's where I had my first experience of drama. I remember playing a, a maid in, in some, some drama or other, in German. This was in German. Uh, but some of the actors, there was Martin Miller, who became quite well known. There was um, Hanne Norbert, his wife, who was also a well-known actress. Um, there were several who um, had been. There was somebody called Marley, um, and we put on Nathan the Wise, uh, uh, Nathan the Weise. Well, in the first instance, when I joined Young Austria, I, I found that they, this was opened a marvelous new chapter in my life, because uh, living where I was and working where I did, I didn't really have very intimate social contact with youngsters of my own age or people who, who shared my interest. For instance, soon I became what was called a cultural organizer and then I became a group leader and I started giving talks and uh, organizing things and so on. So that, that was a, a great outlet for me. Austria House. That was a house that I don't even know who opened it, but you could go there and spend an evening amongst your friends. For instance, all the people that I know now, and we are still friends, we met at the Austria House. All my friends. Very regular Heimabende where you had talks, political discussions, singing, <laughs> then there was table tennis, things like that. Social activities for young people. Lots of outings to Richmond and places like that, you know. Very nice. And, um, and of course they helped uh, people. They had hostels for people working, who were on their own in this country, working in the war factories, things like that. In fact, the very first um, the very first group of young Austria I joined was called the Vorwerker Hostel Group in Primrose Hill, actually. When I joined up, my brother had joined earlier, I had read, said both of us were, it was suggested we should change our name to a name that would be an English name. Uh, don't forget, uh, or a British name, or English name, uh, in case we were either killed or captured. And at that time, we thought our parents were still alive, and uh, uh, so that no reprisals could be taken on our parents. So my brother had picked the name Sharp. As far as I know, out of the telephone directory in Glasgow. I first. I was uh, working in a factory um, machining uniforms and the next job, the next job was auxiliary war work, um, painting lamps for aeroplanes. During daytime I was working in a factory, 
during nighttime I was fire watching when the bombs fell so stood with the helmet like this and uh, the bombs fell oh, everything right here and fell asleep again standing up yeah that's how it was and I wanted to contribute to the war effort so I went to work in the factory and uh, they were the uh, the Suter brothers in Collindale you know you had to clock in and clock out and I was a capstan operator yeah I was a capstan operator paid piecework I remember at the age of 18 I was called up I was interviewed and became a lecturer on music appreciation to his majesty's forces which meant leaving Oxford in a covered jeep because I was not allowed to see where I was going and I was taken to f camps of Army, Navy or Air Force to deliver music appreciation lectures. And that I did about three times a week, fetched in the afternoon from New College and came back late at night. And that enabled me to retain my membership of New College for the next year and a half. I joined something called SOE, Special Operation Executive, because I could speak fluent German. And we were th very thoroughly trained for a long time in every aspect of uh, sabotage and dirty work, every aspect. And then, Towards the end of the war, I was stopped into Austria, of course, into near Judenburg, and I stayed there, didn't do much, I stayed there till the end of the war. My brother was also discharged slightly before me, and when we were discharged, we he got a letter from the Refugee Children's Movement which informed us what had happened to, as far as they could tell, to our parents because we were desperate to try and find what uh, there was. We tried desperately, immediately, to, to get in touch with them. We had no address to write to. I mean, the, the last address, were, of course, they, they had gone from there and nobody knew where they were because we, we felt by then that um, they were no longer alive because they would have done everything to get in touch with us. I was mainly concerned to look for relatives and I couldn't find any. My uncles, everybody in, Aus in Vienna that were related to boxers, they were all exterminated. And people, my grandparents and people like this in Poland also vanished from, you wouldn't, how could you find them? I just wanted to, to go hopefully to find my brother when I couldn't, not at the time, and certainly my father because that I didn't have any hope to find him in Vienna itself, but I still had a hope to find him. I remember being in a cinema with my sister after the end of the war when they liberated some of the camps and there were all these graphic newsreels of conditions in the, in the concentration camps. And, I mean, we were just, I remember we had to leave the cinema. We couldn't take it. We really couldn't take it. Well, through the Red Cross, my, my mum, I didn't know she was, she was, she was alive. And they sent a, uh, they phoned me. Are you to get through the glatter? I said, yes, why, what, what do you want? And she, they said, well, there's your mo mother here. Would you not like to have her here uh, with you? I said, but where were, I, I was speechless. For me, it was absolutely like an angel coming back, you know, and I said, I thought you were dead. I got a job to be a milliner. I went to a very big place, a very big shop like Kendall's. It was called J. Jones in Oldham Street. 
and I served my apprenticeship there for four years and became a milliner. Besides the match factory, I worked in a rubber factory where they made tires, firestones. Great West Road. I worked there mainly. I worked daytime, and that that was nighttime, so I had two jobs. I started helping my husband on the market. He's 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 he sold handbags on the market. That was was that was his boss his business, and that's how it was. When I got married, I was back in the tailoring trade. <laughs> and I started going to evening classes. I took O levels and I took A levels at Birkbeck. And then I continued for the first year of the degree course at Birkbeck. And then I got a scholarship and I went to King's College in the Strand. And there I took a history degree. I subsequently became a teacher. But eventually, I got more ambitious and started writing books. When I finally became, as it were, a fully fledged actress, <laughs> um, I, I remember the only jobs that, I, that anybody was interested in offering me. I mean, I used to go to these interviews and, uh, yeah, yes, dear, we'll, we'll get in touch. We'll get in touch. Don't get in touch with us. We'll get in touch with you. Until somehow or other, perhaps I mentioned or it came up that I was bilingual. So suddenly they took a, a, a great interest in me. And um, it, it sort of happened that bit by bit that I did, I ended up doing quite a lot of work for the BBC as a, as a foreign actress. <laughs> so I had to relearn my, my accent. I remember playing a, a Hungarian. I am a sort of a hybrid composer falling between two, if not more, stools. Um, <clears throat> a good deal of my music is music, uh, is theater music. And if it's not theater, it is theatrically motivated. I played for the composer, if he's good, if he's good composer, and for God. And the people, they were allowed to listen, but I didn't play for them. But they were allowed to listen. After all, they pay for it. <laughs> it was only a chance meeting that I got into films, really, into documentary films. And during the war, of course, many cameramen were called up and used by the Army and Navy and Air Force as cameramen in their film units. So there were vacancies, they needed people. I found great tolerance here. People liked my accent. And uh, I found that the British recognized as even a small talent like mine. I think it put an additional um, experience on on that not as a musician but as a person yes definitely it's not everybody who who is who who at an early age has to leave everything behind go to a foreign country and start again. I don't think it harmed me. I think I have a much broader outlook on the world than I would have had if I had remained in Vienna. So I think actually it's, it has enriched me greatly. I have been at the receiving end of uh, the old experience as, as somebody who was totally passive. None, none of these things were something to which I 
made a, a deliberate contribution. I, I, I was just uh, thrown around by the by the tides of history. So it has affected me that I can see the necessity to help other people. If I would have grown up in the in, in where everything is all right, where I don't see the misery that other people have to live, or, or, or the difficulties other people have got, perhaps I wouldn't have been active in communal work. I have got a chip on my shoulder. The moment I open my mouth to strange people, where do you come from? You see, Although I'm extremely happy in England, yeah? It's my home. They've accepted me. It's my home. Um, there, in Vienna, I went back twice. I have no accent. I'm one of them. <laughs> I have no chip on my shoulder. I don't feel anybody owes me anything. In fact, on the contrary, I feel very grateful to the many, many people. For instance, to my dear mother, what courage she must have had to sign that paper sending me away. To Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson, to the many people involved in various welfare organizations. I feel very humble, very grateful. Deep down, although I feel very British, I do, um, I like the way of life here, but there's something in me that is, you know, still very continental. I have no continental Jewish identity. I have a Jewish atten uh, identity and I have a British one. I am Viennese. I say to myself, yes, I am Viennese. And I am away, I'm no, I don't live in Vienna and I don't need to live in Vienna because the Vienna that I need I have it right here inside me. But I certainly don't regard myself as an Austrian anymore nor do I regard myself although I've lived now a very large part of my life in Scotland as a Scot. You can't become a Scot. I certainly feel at home in Scotland but that's a different matter altogether. I'm not English either. My wife is English but not, we're not typical of anything. We're wandering Jews. A Viennese Jew. <laughs> yes, I was born one and I hope to die one. Yes, I'm very proud of it. I think I'm, I suppose I'm British. It's very difficult. I'm sort of half and half. I would say I've, I'm Austrian. I was born in Austria. How can I possibly lose my identity? I was born there and German is my native tongue. Although I think in English, so I prefer to speak English and write English. But uh, I, I'm sort of half, I suppose half and half. I'm still Austrian um, technically, my nationality, though I only have indirect links with Austria, I do still have links with Austria. So I'm, I'm something in between, neither this nor that. A ruthless cosmopolitan to some extent. But I am used to Britain, of course, and uh, this is where I live. I feel British. Mm. I love it. I'm always grateful for be for them accepting us here. I am. If I if I saw the Queen to speak to, I would thank her. Really, I was often thought of writing a letter. You know, because I've watched her grow up, and I feel very English and and very accepted here. Don't don't feel out of place at all. I'm aware of the fact that uh, I came to this country, and this country offered me sanctuary. Um, I identify to some degree with Viennese music. I watch the uh, New Year's Day concert every year from Vienna. Uh, I, 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 feel some, I, I do feel some attachment to Vienna. I still have a little bit of the Austrian culture with me. I still love to hear Leha. I still love to hear the old um, uh, songs of, of Vienna of years ago. Of course quite a number in my so-called music library. 
but I'm very British. Um, to me, this is my home. In fact, not only British, I'm South Ender. <laughs> So Vienna, Wien at the on the airport at the airport, you know, big thrill. So come back without the anxiousness, you know, as a, as a British citizen. For the first time I was back in, in Austria, I had a a battle inside me was going on, and I thought it was this excitement, excitement of being back again, the place where I was born after all. And then I thought, why should I be so excited? They threw me out of here. There's a battle going on, but it's the land, it's not the people, it's the land itself. It is the land of my birth, never mind the people. And there was such a war going on inside me about my emotions and my feelings of going back to Austria. I can't tell you, I, I was in such a turmoil. The first thing we saw was some of the Austrians, the elderly Austrian people, dressed typically with the, with the hats and the fur coats and so you know, then you begin to wonder what were they during the war. <clears throat> but halfway through that day, I said to myself, what am I worried about? I said, and I said to myself in Germany, ich bin ein Engländer. <laughs> when I came back, on the very next day, I felt different. I felt as though I'd got something off my shoulders or something out of my system. I think I'm almost clinging to my hate. I have to admit it, it's, it's a hatred I have for the, for the Austrians, for the Viennese, because they were more ardent Nazis than the Germans. My head was telling me that the young generation was different. They had nothing to do with it, but I just didn't want to know. And, I mean, people were very friendly in Vienna when uh, we asked the way or anything, uh, went out of their way to uh, be helpful. But I just, I just didn't want to know. I was very, very angry, and I, it took me years to get over the anger of what had happened. Uh, this, is, this is really a fault in my character, but uh, it, was, it was very hard. It was very hard to, to go, for example, to Paracelsus Gasse, where we lived. Yes, that's a funny feeling when you go back after all these years. Many things were the same. The memories started coming back to me. I went to Buchengasse 84, erster Stock, Tier 15. I wondered what I was going to expect to see, but the block was still standing. I went to the post office opposite, where as a kid I used to sort of uh, go on the trolleys, you know, the postal trolleys down the hill. It all came back to me. I went to the Atava Park, the school was still there, but after only two days, I wanted to get away again. I realized then England was my home. One, don't make victims of others. And two, don't be a victim yourself. Get out of the victim business. So the answer is, if you take measures to deal with the dangers before they are impossible to deal with, then perhaps help will come. What I would say is that uh, I, I, I think it's very important that people should take careful notice of what's going on around them, even be active in politics if that's their... Uh, if that's their way, if that's their trend. And uh, because if you don't keep a very sharp watch, people can get away with things which they shouldn't. Behave like a, a normal person and behave like a good person. And that's what I have in mind. And I hope it'll help me with it. Try to be as helpful as I can. And, um uh, I think uh, I sometimes wonder whether I believe in God, but there must be something, and there must be some reason why I was saved and somebody else wasn't. Try to help people. People are in need 
try to give some time, give some effort, give some love to the community, to the people that desperately need it. And you never know, you may need it as well sometimes, so you better give it now whilst you can. To me, there's only all this racism that we get now. I can only acknowledge, as I said before, I can only acknowledge one race, and that's the human race. People should try to get on with one another. Life is really too short to be otherwise. One should try to get on with one another and um, be kind, be good. You must remember where you come from and then you, sh then you should be able to work out where you're going. You should find out who you are by asking yourself, what are my antecedents? Where do I come from? And then you will understand who you are. And then you will have the strength to, to cope with the problems that we all have to cope with. You have to be true to yourself. You don't do anything that you yourself feel might lose your own self-respect. And that is terribly important. You must keep your, your self-respect. That means also you have to work hard and you have to don't do unto any other people what you would not want done to you. I bring my kids up to be tolerant, to be understanding with any religion and to forgive. But it's very difficult. I can't forgive the Nazis what they did. What they did. I can't. Not with the best will in the world. You live a normal life, but you never ever forget. You cannot forget. And I wouldn't want to. Can I forgive? That's difficult too. But life must go on.